when most herbicide labels have been developed, cover crops were not a popular thing. And so the Monsantos and the DuPonts and the Bayers, they really never took into consideration the implications of establishing a cover crop uh, during the season uh, that that herbicide was uh, applied. And uh, because of that, there are situations where the restrictions on the label you know, may not really be pertinent to what you're doing. Now, what I like to stress is I think there's two things, well, two different ways cover crops might be used. One, if they're going to be used for forage or grazing, what Joe is going to talk about, then you need to follow uh, the label because, again, the label is a law. Now, if you're using the cover crop just for conservation purposes, for purposes of uh, enhancing soil quality, then it's sort of wishy-washy whether you need to follow the label. Uh, when I talked with the IDALs last year, they sort of said, yes, if it's uh, only for conservation purposes, then so if you're going to plant something like a tillage radish, it's going to be killed by the uh, frost and you're not going to turn animals out in that field, then even if you use a herbicide label that says don't establish anything within 12 months of application, <laughs> it's still okay because that 12 months restriction was there either because of concerns about phytotoxic residues affecting the establishment of the crop or it was there because of concerns about residues being present in the crop that was planted. So the first thing is to determine, you know, whether or not there's any likelihood of that uh, cover crop being harvested. Then if it's not going to be harvested for forage, you can ignore the label. But what you want to do is make sure that that herbicide is not going uh, interfere with the establishment of that cover crop. And I think that herbicide companies are realizing that cover crops are becoming a fixture of the landscape and that they need to change their approach to uh, labeling so that we're not in this uh, fuzzy zone of am I violating the label or not. And so you know, this is a typical type of restriction you'd see on a lot of herbicide labels, you know, do not rotate the food or feed crops other than those listed below. And usually cover crops would not be listed below because in the past they were not that popular and so the companies didn't include them. And then basically says for all crops not on the label, follow 12 months restriction. So that basically would eliminate using any cover crop with this herbicide, because I can guarantee you that for most herbicides, they're not going to have cover crop species listed. So, you know, that's the big issue with these uh, label restrictions. This is a uh, statement on another herbicide label. This is a relatively recent change, and it's basically saying if the thing you're establishing is not being used for food or feed, then you can plant anything. Uh, but what you need to keep in mind is that this herbicide, you know, herbicide with this statement there, possibly could have residues present in late summer that would inhibit the uh, establishment of your cover crop. So it gives you the freedom to plant your crop but it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have problems with the herbicide residues. And so what I'm going to uh, focus on the rest of my time is, is how do you determine the potential for a herbicide to interfere with the cover crop? And, and here in Iowa, we're under um, a, a situation where I think these herbicides do have the potential to interfere with the establishment of some of our cover crops simply because of our short growing season that when we plant the cover crops there's not a lot of time for those plants to uh, get established before the onset uh, of winter 
And if those herbicides even slow down the establishment of the, herb, of the, of the plant at all, that can't interfere with what you want that uh, crop to do. You know, if we had eight weeks of good growing conditions, then sometimes the, that cover crop might be able to tolerate the herbicide. But with that limited time frame we have, it, it puts us at a, a greater threat than people in the eastern part of the country or, or south of us. So what factors to uh, consider? Well, first, you know, what herbicide are you using? Every herbicide has, you know, its own specific uh, persistence. That persistence can vary widely depending on the characteristics of your soil. And so one of the things we passed out is a uh, handout that the University of Wisconsin developed. Okay. And it essentially gives you the restrictions that are on the herbicide labels. Um, but again, that may not always provide you accurate information because those restrictions that are on the label may not necessarily uh, be present because of phytotoxic residues. They may be there because of concerns about residues uh, being present in the plant that's established. Or in many cases, the herbicide companies take a very conservative approach because they don't want to take on the liability of, of a failed uh, crop establishment. So, you know, those are the label requirements. And again, if you're only using the cover crop for conservation purposes, for uh, soil quality benefits, nutrient management, then you don't necessarily need to follow those labels. Rate applied, that makes a, a big difference. You know, some herbicides can be applied at a wide range of rates. And obviously, if you use, you know, a half a pound of something, let's say we're talking about atrazine, if you apply, apply a half a pound of atrazine, that's going to have much less risk of affecting the cover crop than if you would apply a pound and a half. And then finally, the uh, application date. And I can't remember this gentleman's name, but he was at a meeting I was at um, in Atlantic earlier this week. And he mentioned that he had uh, applied a residual herbicide after his soybeans were established. He's been struggling uh, controlling late season water hemp. So when he applied a post-emergence product to uh, control the weeds, he added a pre-emergence herbicide to control the weeds that emerged afterwards. And so he was applying a, a pre-emergence herbicide, I assume in, in late June, uh, early July. Late June warrant. Yeah, so he applied warrant, which is a herbicide normally would have been applied early May when the crop was first established, that because of late emerging water hemp, it was applied in late June. Therefore, that herbicide has much less time to degrade before the establishment of the cover crop. Uh, oftentimes, we have much less rain throughout July and August. Rain is essential for the degradation of herbicides. And so, I'm not sure what cover crop you tried to establish, but it was a failure. I think it was rye. Well, as a hand plots of dozens, okay. rye came up and died. Right. And so, so that was a scenario that warrant, <clears throat> and warrant is a form of a formulation of acetochlor sold as harness and surpass that I would say normally would be perfectly safe for majority of cover crops because it breaks down relatively quickly in the soil. But under this scenario where it was applied in late June with very little rainfall, the rest of the growing season, it re, uh, remained at toxic concentrations. Yeah, he kind of answered my question, but are there certain herbicides that would just delay the sprouting of a cover crop seed? Do all the herbicides only act as the seed sprouts? This, this would be very important because you know we want to in a real life situation in your soybean crop and you got some fairly late right. herbicide application, but you want to apply that cover crop seed on 
83 early. What, what, what's going to happen there? I mean, will it just be late germination and so the herbicide will kind of wear off and then the seed can sprout? Okay, so the, the question is whether the herbicide delay the sprouting or uh, I think that's a big question. So herbicides are only active on seeds as they begin to germinate. Okay. And, and so they don't delay the germination. And, and so, at, right, so as the seed begins to germinate, uh, the herbicide is in the, uh, is dissolved in the water, in the soil, and it uh, is absorbed into the seedling. And, and in many cases, it won't kill the cover crop outright simply because it's a, going to be a, a fairly low concentration but it, it will slow down the establishment make that cover crop uh, more prone to other stresses and if it's a something that you want to overwinter it may prevent it from getting mature enough to be able to overwinter so, so you this know this is the interface this is the exact interface i think you're talking right. about right right so, you know, the rate applied and the application date and the, uh, the persistence of that individual herbicide. And so all those are going to influence it. Then the environment. So we just talked about uh, the, uh, you know, rainfall. Uh, most of our herbicides are broken down by microbial activity. Uh, and your peak microbial activity is early in the spring when the soils are, are warming up. Uh, and so if the herbicide is present at that time, you lose uh, the herbicide relatively quickly. But if we're applying the herbicide in, uh, into June, uh, there the uh, soil temperatures are such that the microbial activity is, is, is slowed down. We may not have as consistent as rainfall. And so when the soils dry out, herbicides don't break down uh, very quickly. So. Uh, you know, in terms of carryover to rotational crops, those of you who are conventional farmers realize that, you know, carryover is a, is the greatest threat in, in dry growing seasons. And so anytime we have a prolonged drought during the season, uh, that enhances herbicide persistence, increases the, uh, the risk. And then finally, the, the, the cover crop sensitivity. Uh, we know that the species uh, vary widely in how susceptible they are to the different herbicides. And uh, I'm going to briefly go through some research one of my students did where she was trying to establish the, the relative sensitivity of a, a variety of species. And basically what you know, her research you know, showed is that cereal rye is the, the most tolerant um, species of the uh, popular cover crops that are established. You know, we view that as, as good because, you know, cereal rye, for, especially for conventional systems, probably is the species that's best adapted uh, for Iowa. Uh, radish was the most uh, sensitive. And then your legumes fall in between uh, the rye and uh, the radish. Uh, but, you know, for a specific herbicide, you could have, you know, some of the legumes more sensitive to radish. But generally speaking, I think that's a safe uh, have a slide. But anywhere from, I think, a half X to a tenth of an X uh, and a range between there. So if we look at, you know, the herbicides that really cause problems, so uh, Corvus, uh, that's a premix of, of uh, two herbicides balance and it has a uh, ALS inhibitor herbicide in there too. And so you can see the balance, uh, well, the Corvus was uh, hotter than the, uh, the balance. So that tells you it was the additive effect of the two herbicides. So there's an example of multiple herbicides causing a greater problem than a single active ingredient. Uh, but in some situations, one of the additional herbicides you use might have very short residual and not uh, be an additive. And then Hornet is a, a premix of, of two herbicides. And so um, which one is causing uh, the problems in that scenario, I'm really not confident. And so these are the uh, soybean herbicides we looked at. and. Uh, you can see they were less injurious than the, the corn herbicides, and I think that 
you know, if you farm conventionally, you realize you probably have a harder time managing your weeds and your soybeans because herbicides are not as persistent. So, so that data, or those, those uh, tables are in your handout. Uh, they're just guidelines. Uh, you can look at the labels and see what the labels and that can help you guide uh, guide you in your decision making. Uh, so the, the thing to keep in mind is that the herbicide persistence is, is highly variable. Each herbicide has its own characteristics and they're strongly affected by soil type and the environment. So consider the rate of the herbicide you apply, you know, what the conditions have been since that application and the uh, species uh, that you use. And so I think I, I'll better stop here and I'll give it to Joe now so that um, he can get through his material and then if you have more questions, hopefully there'll be time at the end.